Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the first ever winners of the Flow Stone and Roger D. Stone Award for Artistry in Film. And I have to say Fire of Love is well deserving of this. Uh, and I, uh, I saw the movie at Sundance. And we're welcoming here the two producers, Shane Boris and Ina Fitchman, and the director, Sarah Dosa. Hello. Hello. Hi. So wonderful to be here with you. <laughs> so, um, as I said, Sundance, you uh, you won an editing award there at Sundance, and um, it really was quite the hit. Um, and I'm just curious, um, when you went in there, and I'm sure you were disappointed that you weren't showing it live at the Eccles or, or the library or, or, or the racket club <laughs> or wherever it was supposed to be, but um, did you get feedback on it? And what kind of feedback? And, and there was a sort of bidding war. Tell us a little bit about the Sundance part of the story. Maybe the producer should do this part. Well, I mean, we all went into the festival, you know, it was actually, as you know, it was about two weeks before our premiere that we learned that the festival was not going to be in person. So it took a really quick pivot on our part to figure out, you know, we were very determined to show the film live in some capacity. So we had a friends and family screening in LA, but our sales agent submarine were busy on the ground showing the film to buyers a few days before the festival. And when the reviews started to come out, of course, as these things do, the it, it heated up a little bit, quite a bit, actually. And we spent um, a few days, Shane and myself and Sarah and our executive producers from Sandbox Film, um, speaking to buyers who were super interested in the film and for very different reasons. And um, I think we're all happy, and Shane, maybe you want to continue with this little story, that we ended up with Nat Geo because they really understood what we were doing with the film and that it was a creative documentary and a love story and also a science story so that was that is really really exciting for us it does feel like a good fit but shane what what were you what did you what were you looking for what was what was it that you needed to have happen yeah you know i think i think we were all like really um pleasantly surprised and shocked actually because i think when we were making this film like we really just made it in the way that we thought it should be made. And we're kind of, we had a sense that we wanted it to have a large audience and we wanted it to be um, to be special and meaningful for folks. But I think we were, we were making it kind of in our own, in a vacuum in a way, um, really just it, trying to understand and suss out the vision that Sarah, Sarah had and that the entire team had and, and like bring it to the world. And then you never quite know, like you think you have something special, you're watching it and like you're feeling it and you're crying. But then when you show it to an audience, you're like, okay, we're not, we're not completely crazy. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe our reaction is, is somehow representative of how other people are going to feel about it too. And so I think that was the most extraordinary part of the, the Sundance experience was to see, to see a bit of people seeing a little bit of what we saw too, or what we hoped for in the film. So Sarah, what you managed to accomplish, and, and you know how, how tricky it is in the documentary world, you made something that wasn't like everything else. And you set yourself a very, very daunting, I think, task and pulled it off. So um, run us through from the beginning now, uh, what, what some of the um, challenges were that you set for yourself in order to, to accomplish this. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, first, I just have to say I was so lucky to be working on this project with Shane and Ina and our fabulous editors, um, Aaron Casper and Jocelyn Chapu and our executive producers from Sandbox Film. So it's really a wonderful team effort in all of this. Um, but there are there are tremendous challenges along the way. Um, I do genuinely believe, though, that each challenge kind of led to a new creative opportunity, um, which was hard to find at first, but but each one really did. Um, I think first and foremost, once uh, once we received the the bounty of the craft archive, um, we realized that you know there was no sync sound, uh, so our editors had to totally rebuild soundscapes for all the sixteen millimeter footage. Um, and there, the way the archive was organized, the images were extraordinary, but there were so many questions that abounded throughout the footage. You know, there'd be a shot of a volcano, a shot of steam and smoke, a shot of bubbling lava, and then an iguana or some guides on horseback or Katya sitting in an intertube. And it's like, how do we make sense of these things? Um, 
So that was a, a tremendous challenge to try to understand the context and try to draw connective tissues. Uh, but we really realized these were the things that Maurice and Katya were curious about. Um, and it showed their personality, their, their connection to life. Um, and of course, the heart of their life was volcanoes. Um, but uh, that kind of exploration of the questions and, and all that we couldn't quite know um, allowed us to really embrace this wider theme about mystery and the unknown, whether it's the mystery of volcanoes or the mysteries of the human heart. Um, so that, that's just one example. Um, uh, but yeah, I feel really lucky to have gotten to work through these challenges with, with my team. So too. how did the archive come your way? Oh. Well, um, I can answer that because um, Sarah, of course, had heard about the archive and it had moved a few years ago from one, like, from one place to another. And um, we discovered that it was in this small archive house in Nancy, France. And this very small team there, three curators had been basically taking care of it for quite a few years. And, you know, some of the footage had been used before in television shows and parts of other films, but nobody had ever requested that the entire archive be digitized. And they were very excited because they loved this archive. This was their treasure. So it took them about four months to, art, to digitize all the footage for us. They had, they had a complete log. It was relatively clear what was in there, but as, as Sarah probably could say, there were a lot of surprises too. So we've been collaborating with this Archive House Image since the very beginning, and um, they're very, very happy with the film. I mean, they- <laughs> They should be, they should you know, be. For them, um, it really is a legacy to the crafts. So how did you decide to shape the story? It, uh, you have a love story, you have a, uh, compelling addiction uh, as if they were storm chasers you know uh, going after <clears throat> tornadoes instead of tornadoes it's it's volcanoes um, and you also you also have uh, a relationship to the media which I found sort of fascinating um, and then um, you know a cautionary tale so so how did you figure that out and I imagine the narration was one part of the answer yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, we wanted to shape this as uh, a love story, um, but not just any kind of love story, but specifically a love triangle. And so it was really important to us to establish Maurice and Katya and how they're pulled together through their love of volcanoes. You know, the closer they get, the more danger they encounter, but that danger kind of causes them to, to react to volcanoes in, in different ways. Um, so that, that love triangle was first and foremost in how we decided to structure the narrative. Um, we also see it as a mythic love story. Um, Maurice and Katya are really mythic characters. And so there's kind of tropes of, of myth and um, kind of this epic, grand, magically real scale that we wove through, um, which we thought could really kind of attend to the, the magic and the grandiosity, if that's a word, <laughs> um, both of love and, and also volcanoes. Um, but also specifically within our structuring of the story, um, we really wanted to tell a story about creation, destruction, and creation again, um, which of course is apropos to volcanoes and the way volcanoes both create new life and new land, as well as destroy life and land. Um, but then the, this life cycle that very much dovetails with recent Katya, whose spirit, in our opinions, very much lives on. So that was another big organizing principle. Um, Shane had a, a big hand in, in the, the writing process, so I, I should let you. Yeah, tell, tell us about that because um, um, it's a little bit, um, I mean, you got rave, rave reviews, but there's um, always a bit of a debate, you know, about about narration. It is some people frown on it. It's as though it's um, somehow a, a lazy way out. <clears throat> Excuse my frog. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, um, you 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 picked um, a, an approach that was very uh, poetic, lyrical, um, whimsical, and you picked a narrator. Miranda July, who who embodies all of those things, so you that was a calculated risk, I would say. Go 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 for it, Shane. I think like in in filmmaking, as in love, there are there are gaps in our understanding, and there are gaps in the information that's available to us. And a part of that process is a, a an unearthing of of what exists. And I think we did that in our filmmaking, and we thought that. The also one of the roles of a narrator could be to help us see where those gaps are and to help fill those in with not not just answers but with questions and we sort of had this this guiding guiding idea that you know getting getting close to what you love gives you more understanding 
even though you can never understand. And that's what helps give us a meaningful life and give us a meaningful death. And the narrator's like role in that formulation was so important because she had to, she had to engage in that process of question asking, answer, plus answer like um, receiving some answers that proposed more questions. And she was sort of like a, a guide for us as we were making the film, sort of a, a stand-in for our process and also a way we thought the audience could, could enter into Maurice and Katya's story in a, in a personal way so that they were also, um, you know, a part of the love story too. So was, was Terrence Malick an influence on, on where you were going there? A little philosophizing, a little, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, he was definitely one of the, the filmmakers um, who we were trying to you know, uh, find inspiration from and, and um, uh, yeah, definitely washed our eyes, but with some Terrence Malick. Um, we watched a, a, a lot of French New Wave films, which actually kind of first helped us set the Go Dar. <laughs> we watched Godard, we watched uh, Jules and Jim, um, played a big role, um, especially given the love triangle uh, that finds its way through a, a lot of French New Wave films. Um, we first did this because that formed the cultural backdrop of when Maurice and Katia themselves were coming of age. But in their own work, you sense a lot of the aesthetic um, uh, styles uh, from that period. Um, for example, in Maurice's cinematography, you see these really playful like snap zooms and, and pans and, uh, and the way that they wrote was wonderfully bombastic. Um, they authored nearly 20 books together and a lot of them were written in the first person and it reminded me of some of uh, Truffaut's narration, for example. Um, and then just the romance that lays at the heart of, of so many films of that era. So um, that was a big influence. And then of course, contemporary filmmakers who draw a lot of inspiration from French New Wave. Um, we watched Itu Mama Tambien um, for example, and, and Beginners and Wes Anderson were, of course, getting a lot of, you know, Wes Anderson comments, um, but we, we had a lot of fun kind of, um, yeah, seeking out different inspirations that could help shape how we were going to fit together this collage story, but always rooted in Maurice and Katya, like they very much set the tone for us. So the way, part of how you structured it was to say that they were fascinated by one kind of volcano um, that was slightly less dangerous, even though it looked horrifying, than the other kind of volcano. And then you, have, of course, end up with the um, extraordinary um, material uh, uh, that leads to their to their death. How did you, did you how did you capture um, the archive footage that you needed for that in order to to you went outside too you went out and got other footage that wasn't in the archive. Yes, yeah. So uh, most of the film is Maurice and Katya's 16 millimeter footage um, and Katya's photographs that they took. Um, but there was about 45 to 50 hours that our archival researcher Nancy Marcotte um, tracked down, which was um, interviews with them. They were featured in documentaries in, in the 70s and 80s. Um, they were celebrities in France, and so luckily they, you know, they were captured on media um, there. And so we were able to work with that. And, and since the 16 millimeter footage didn't have any sync sound. Uh, that kind of bucket of material was so helpful in terms of like hearing their voices, seeing their personalities play out on screen, getting to especially witness their banter um, in one particularly fun interview. Um, so, so that kind of bucket uh, comprised um, the, the other footage that um, we got to, to play with. But how about the tracking down of, of what you needed for the, um, the, the, the denouement, if you like? Yeah, so, so that um, belonged to, that's a, like, Ina can speak to this more, but that was a Japanese archive that we were yeah. able to, to get our hands on um, in order to, uh, yeah, tell the story of, of the death. Yeah, I mean, as, as Sarah said, there, there, there's very little footage of this, and it's very sensitive in nature, too. So, um, you know, we hired a, an archival researcher in Japan who tracked this down for us. It's, it's a, it, you did you just did a great job with with that um talk about the music that you used uh, that was another decision uh from brian eno uh, onward um you you needed to fill in the silences i guess um 
Yeah, we, we knew we wanted a, a big score um, uh, to complement the bigness of volcanoes. And we had a lot of fun brainstorming a potential composer for Fire of Love. Um, we landed on uh, Nicolas Godin um, as our composer from, uh, he's one half of the air duo. Um, and he brought out uh, this really fun, playful, kind of retro futuristic style um, to, to the score. Um, but we, we complemented um, kind of his, his wonderful work uh, with Brian Eno, um, with some other air tracks um, and some other kind of uh, uh, music that kind of played with the same um, kind of uh, synths and uh, electronic music from uh, the early 80s and late 70s to kind of establish this world. Um, we, we really see like the, the precipice between the late seventies and the early eighties as like the time period where our film lives. And, and so music that kind of brought out that fun and playful feel um, was really important to us. Uh, but we also wanted to, you know, uh, we, we wanted to set the musicality of, of the film with also pulling back and allowing the volcanoes to be instruments themselves. So we were trying to find the right balance between what scenes really kind of uh, carried forth with with music and, and which ones um, you allowed the sound design uh, to really kind of breathe and be felt most. So talk about the the editing process and and how you you chose um, uh, the extraordinary uh, footage that you did. Uh, one of my one of my favorite shots is the one because you had to give us a sense of the tactile. Uh, danger. Uh, so I'm sure everybody says the same thing. You know, the 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 guy's shoe going down on the on the rock, the molten rock. I mean, you just must. I, I have this image of you in the editing room going, "Ooh, ooh, we're gonna use that." <laughs> you know, talk about uh, that process. Um, I'll start off, and Shane and I know. Please jump in. I know I'm talking a lot, but yeah, we we were doing that constantly in the edit room of just like, ah, look at this. We have to use that, and look at this. I can't believe I did that. So there was like so many fun surprises throughout. Um, uh, Aaron and Jocelyn, our, our fabulous editors, often talk about how they would go and look for one specific shot. For example, where early in the film, trying to establish the character of, you know, red volcanoes, they, they go on a red volcano lava hunt, and all of a sudden they find footage of like a gray volcano from Indonesia in 1971 that they had been looking for forever. And they would get sidetracked and be like, okay, well, here's this amazing shot. And so it was always a fishing expedition because of how the archive was. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we definitely left a, a ton of fantastic imagery on the cutting room floor. Um, really feel like 20 films could be made with this archive and we're telling, you know, a very specific sliver of it. Um, uh, but yeah, we were really looking for the shots that kind of could connote that, that combination of both love and danger all at once. Um, uh, to really kind of put you inside of Maurice and Katya's um, psychology as best as possible. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, as it is with any film and with any experience, we kind of like take in what we're around to a certain extent and we filter it through ourselves. But like just watching Maurice and Katya so much, I think in, in, imbued all of us with the spirit of, of kind of discovery and exploration. And that was a part of the process of just the, the excitement of like finding and exploring and getting closer to, to what was so fascinating. And though we weren't like feeling the heat necessarily of the volcano directly, there was like some quality of, of, of that kind of transmission of feeling so connected to what we were watching. No, they were compelled. They were, they were really, did you, you know, what, what would, a, what, what does, what do psychiatrists say about what they were afflicted with? Oh, that's a deep question. <laughs> no, yeah. you're, you know, I think you're the first, you're the first person to sort of use the word addiction uh, yeah. to us as we're as we're talking that I can recall, and and I think there is a there's a quality of of being so enamored, so in love that you can't any. I mean, Katya says it herself, like we can't imagine any other way. And when when you can't imagine any other way, there's there's a there's a real need to be to be close to what you love, whether that's a person or a part of the natural world, and. And I think that was like certainly, certainly them. And they had they had different addictions too, like <laughs> same addiction bucket maybe, but but slightly different. And I think that was interesting that we all have these. If if it's not an addiction, we all have many of us have these like fascinations or or deep compelling interests, and they sometimes exist side by side or they're similar to someone else's. But if you if you can find the people or the community or the individual, or the or even just the volcano, like one one part of the world that that um, matches or somehow. Um, 
helps helps make more whole um then you're like in for quite an adventure of a life they weren't and, entirely in sync that was also interesting yeah. oh absolutely yeah. it was yeah. a portrait of a marriage as well a working exactly. marriage a working marriage absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so um so how did it how, I'm, I'm curious about how you two um uh it came out at a tight 90 minutes so there must have been some tussles in the editing room as you figured out if i'm getting this right it sounds shane like you're you're sort of the writer part of the of the team in terms of the structure of the narration and 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 you sarah are very much in charge as the director but but it, it sounds like there were different buckets you guys were all uh, working in but I think uh, I'll, for, you know, everyone in the team was like really involved in the process and, and Aaron and Jocelyn too, like it was, it was really a team effort to write all of this, but Sarah can answer the rest. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Me, Shane, Aaron, and, and Jocelyn wrote the narration, of, of course, with a, a lot of input from Ina. So it, it was very collaborative. Um, in terms of the the tight 90 minutes, uh, there was a lot that we realized through, through the process. Um, for example, we at first speaking of narration, we um, the narration kind of functioned uh, in terms of exposition to help kind of carry the story forward. But we really realized we needed to peel it back and peel it back uh, more so. But um, you mean there was more narration and you cut it down to less? Yes. Yeah, we cut it way, 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 way down, and we would notice. Um, like even a word here or there, an extra sentence would create a kind of block to, to the viewer. Um, like there was so much information that we were trying to communicate, so many different images, music, sound, uh, trying to establish these different characters and science and philosophy all at once. So we realized that we had to be um, as light on our feet as possible while still trying to maintain depth. Um, that was a, a tricky dance. Um, but I, I remember we had a viewing of the film, I think it was like right before the, uh, the final um, and it didn't work. And so we pulled, we like peeled and all of us like felt it. We're just like, ah, oh, it's not quite there. Um, and we just lifted out probably like, like not very much at all, but it was, it, was, it was stuff that was like blocking these narrative channels, if that makes sense. It really was like a sentence, a tiny like montage. It was like the stuff that gives you a slight pause that, that clogged up the momentum. And then the film, uh, we felt like could breathe again and could really work. Um, and I, I feel like that really kind of spoke to our collaborative efforts and, and how all of us were really trying to problem solve and, and think through and, and figure out what wasn't working and to really kind of listen to um, our own instincts and in, in the crafting process. So did yeah, you do I, test screenings? We did. Oh, yeah. Talk yeah, about, we, um, maybe Ina can talk about why, why that's important sometimes. Well, I mean, you know, we have been literally immersed, you know, Sarah and Shane and the editors and myself to a certain extent. I never went um, physically into the edit room um, for many months, you know, trying to make the Sundance deadline, you know, you know, we brought on a third editor at one point. And I think we all felt that we had not, not lost perspective, but really needed to step back and see how other people would, you know, understand the film, react to the film emotionally, intellectually. So we, we actually had test screenings and we did one in Montreal. We did, I think, a f quite a few in New York in the end. And um, it was great to get people's perspective because many people had never heard about the story. And I think in, in, you know, in documentary, especially you immerse yourself in, in an edit room or, or more than one edit room for long periods of time. And it's very hard to see the forest through the trees sometimes. And it really helped us, you know, understand how people were responding to the film. And of course, everyone did love it. But at the same time, they also, there were parts that we wanted to, to make sure they understood as well. And that they got the emotional beats of the film in the same way that we did. So it's a very helpful process. And I do it all the time with all of my films. But there's an interesting point and to your like question of the, the kind of the tension and the tessels and things like that too, where Sarah was talking a lot about, you know, it was a it was a huge intention for us all along. We we had a ton of narration that helped sort of tell the story in, in a clear way, but then we knew we had to pull it back to, to make sense. But then there were also parts where we kept pulling and pulling out. And sometimes you lose an essential part of the film too. And you have to sort of like also stand up for your instinct and stand up for what's working. And there was one part with the railway time beat where we we wanted to really get into time as a part of it. And 
we, everyone said it was the, you know, we were saying it's the best part of the movie, but it just doesn't fit in, just doesn't fit in. And like Sarah, to her credit was like, well, we have to find a way to fit this in. Like we just, we have to, it's, it's so crucial to the film. And, and so there's that part too, where you know that the, the forest needs like, need to, you need to pull back, but that unless you have a very specific part, none, nothing else is going to work. And to Sarah's credit, like she was, she was so good at, at both of those parts, like hearing the need to pull, pull stuff back and also standing firm on what really needed to be there. And what, what, why Miranda July, uh, just as a piece of casting, what was it that she, I think she's great, but what, what did she bring to, why did you come to her, think of her? Oh, Miranda, um, I could, I'm, I'm already trying to edit myself because I know I could be quite effusive in, in my praise of her. Um, she's been a, a long time inspiration for a lot of us on the team. Um, I think we've all been so drawn to her way of communicating um, intimacy and kind of this strange familiarity of, of relationships as well as kind of our, yeah, the precarity of what it means to be human. Um, and we initially were, we were thinking maybe a French narrator um, to, to go with our French mm. protagonists. But once Miranda kind of entered into our brainstorming process, we were all just like, yes, like <laughs> we, we actually felt like we had been somehow writing for her voice all along uh, without realizing it. And so once she kind of came into the folds that actually helped to shape our, our writing process even more. And once we recorded with her, um, she just brought such richness and depth uh, to the film. Um, our editor, Jocelyn Shep, who had uh, generously been our temp narrator for a while, she did a great job. Um, so tremendous credit to her. And that really shaped kind of the, the tone. Um, and Miranda was able to kind of, yeah, uh, flesh out such depth and, and um, she brought a real kind of loving curiosity to Maurice and Katia. She connected with them very much. And I feel like you can hear that in Miranda's voice when, as she kind of um, yeah brings to life the, the line. I mean, who else could pull off a bathtub with a hole in it, <laughs> sewing death all around? I mean, you took some real shots here. <laughs> yeah. Those lines were actually, Katya wrote those lines. Um, so that those are straight from Katya's book about, um, yeah, uh, volcanoes uh, uh, throughout Africa. Um, but yeah, the way Miranda delivered it was spot on. I, I really... Feel like she was directly channeling Katya in, in that moment. And, and moment. you know, just to go back to the beginning, we're, we're winding up here, but um, you know, Nat Geo just does feel like a perfect fit. And so they can really take this out, you know, as, as a piece of, of, because, because what is the message here? The message is you don't fool with mother nature, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's certainly our, our hope that people can really be met with the power and the sentience too of our planet. Um, there's so many narratives about the earth as dead or a resource um, to be extracted from something that's unconnected from humanity um, or something you know for humans to, to conquer and to tame. And so we're really hoping instead our, our film can tell a story about the power of the natural world as well as the connections that you can weave um, and connections that are built on kind of love and awe rather than dominance so that that's one great hope thank you very much uh everyone um and uh thank you everybody for participating in the environmental film festival in the nation's capital uh, <laughs> all right bye bye all bye, thank you Anne.